This content is intended for mature audiences and may contain strong opinions or language. Views or opinions expressed by guests or the host should not be considered as medical, financial, legal, or psychiatric advice and are not to be attributed to this platform or its sponsors. Hello, wonderful people. Thank you for joining us on an episode of Bobbing Along with Bob featuring your host, Bob Dub. We are so glad you decided to join us for one of our discussions with many of our interesting and informative guests who are going to share their knowledge, insight, opinion, and most importantly, their life experiences with all of you. If you enjoy this content, please like and share as well as subscribe. Feel free to use the comment section to share your life experiences on today's topic. You can also find the host on Minds.com slash Bob Dub. And now, here is your host, Bob Dub. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Bobbing Along. This is the Shakespeare edition of Bobbing Along, and today we are investigating whether we should, in fact, be quoting Christopher Marlowe and not quoting Shakespeare at all. So, to help me in this very interesting and complex investigation into the court of Elizabeth I, the police state of Elizabethan England, and the intrigue around the theatre of those times. I have with me Otto X of Navakavada Video, uh, Buddhism. Hey Otto. Hello. Welcome, how are you doing? Oh, pretty good, very good to be here. Looking forward to our discussion tonight. Awesome. Awesome, me too. And I also have Roger of Roger Hansen Live, who has taken time out of his incredibly busy streaming schedule to join us today. So, welcome, Roger. Thank you. <clears throat> glad How are you here. doing, Roger? I'm glad to be here, too. I'm doing pretty good. This, this is actually the highlight of my day, so... <laughs> Excellent. Oh, you're too kind. <laughs> That's awesome. oh, it is. Well, I, Roger. I love it. Yeah. I love it. I love Shakespeare's uh, the stuff right here. I love it. And you were just talking to me just before we came onto the show uh -huh. about how Shakespeare and Christopher Marlowe were born almost on the same day. Yeah. Yeah, well, at first they they kept saying that it was the same day, but uh, I did further research and found out that if you go according to the old style dates uh, that England used, Marlowe's birthday was most likely about a few days before, and that would make him about two months older than William Shakespeare, I believe they said. Gosh, that's yeah. so amazing. And he was baptized yeah, at the same time. Wait, yeah, baptized. It was his baptism, not when he was born. It was his oh, baptism. Oh, not his, sorry. Birth, his baptism. Oh, okay. Gosh, that's a right. pretty... Yeah. I was going to say, baptism certificates is often the way we find out about these guys. Yeah. Huh. They're a great source. Glad you said that. Uh, I I I did say uh, birth, which that's a big difference too than the actual baptism, because are you there? It shows they were born. And yeah. you know the thing about the baptism, I, I think they usually figure that traditionally they baptize the kids within three days. So oh. when they have a baptism certificate, they usually consider that that shows the birth date is like uh, two or three days beforehand. So they didn't actually have birth certificates so much, although they did record births sometimes, but everybody had a baptism certificate. That, that was a lot more likely. So it's basically, I think most historians consider it the equivalent of a birth certificate. I mean, after all, you had to be born to be baptized, and it was <laughs> the kind of paperwork that would more or less survive. So 
perfectly valid yeah. to look at the birth or the baptismal certificates, and it gives you a pretty good idea of when these guys were born, probably the, to within a day or two. So mm -hmm. they didn't let kids sit around for too long, because you know kids didn't survive that long. It was yeah. a rough time, so they, they they got you baptized as quickly as they could. Yeah. So Marlo baptized February the twenty sixth. Oh, two months, making him two months older than William Shakespeare, who was baptized the 26th of April. Right. That's pretty weird. So, but, but, but we've established that there are two different people. There are definitely these two different people, even though there's this strange coincidence of their birth. But that's also assuming that uh, Shakespeare from uh, Stratford-upon-Avon was actually the Shakespeare that wrote the plays. Right. So. Right. Yes. Which is and what we're looking at. The problem, the problem is, too, sometimes we have these records, and here's a guy named Christopher Marlowe, and, of course, it's, it's spelt like three or four different ways. So you kind of, there are times when you make an assumption, well, we know he was at like, you know, Cambridge or wherever. We find a record at Cambridge of somebody with a name spelled kind of like his at the same time. So, you know, because he, he spelled it Marlowe, Marley, a lot of times it was phonetic spelling um, because they didn't know uh, it was a vernacular language. They didn't care about, you know, spelling the way they would if it was Latin or Greek. These, you know, just English was, they still had a hold over looking on it as just this temporary language that would change. And of course, the English Renaissance that Marlowe and Shakespeare's writings, whoever wrote them, uh, really helped to usher this in. That's when we started wanting to spell words the same way every time, instead of like having it be a free-for-all of phonetic spelling, which, you know, you read those old manuscripts and those old books even, it's so difficult sometimes to just read them the way we're so used to reading now. Uh, Bob, you and I were talking about reading silently to yourself, which mm -hmm. is a more modern phenomenon. Books were generally meant to be read aloud, and stories were listened to aloud, but we, we have this thing where we can read silently to ourselves a lot faster than someone can speak, but a part of that, I think, is because we have this uniform way of spelling the words now, and uniform typeset so that you can kind of glide over the words you don't have to stop and spell out you know the same word three different ways in the same paragraph mm -hmm. as you do sometimes with these these uh, you know Elizabethan and Jacobian uh, books and uh, people people that wrote these plays I think kind of fueled that um, as the language became more accepted as a, as a way of, of expressing things artistically I think people became more serious about English as a language uh, remember, there wasn't even a dictionary really until Dr. Johnson came along in the 18th century. I think it was like late 18th, early 19th century. When was Johnson active? Up to like 180 something or other. But yeah, I mean, when when you think about it, I, I'm sure there had been other smaller like glossaries and things, but that was really the first real dictionary of the language. It took that long <laughs> before we took our own language seriously. It's kind of amazing. Yeah, it is amazing. It's like uh, <clears throat> one thing that I, I did find out too, which when you're talking about all that, um, and I didn't know until just recently when I was doing research for this, but Marlowe was actually one of the first to uh, get a reputation for uh, using blank verse, um, which became yeah. standard now, you know. Um, that's, that's something. Yeah. I, I I didn't know that until just like doing the research to do this show. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was pretty you know, interesting. It, and that ties right into the whole authorship question because um, one of the things that um, even the mainstream Stratfordian scholars admit that a lot of the Shakespeare plays, especially the early ones, had the hands of more than one author. The, these were working theater uh, um companies that needed a play that would sell so they would bring in other writers the material was changing all the time sort of like a Marx Brothers you know you watch a Marx Brothers movie and it's very funny but when they did their stage shows they varied the show each night and interacted with the audience so um, there, there have been more than one mainstream scholar that uh, suggests that um, 
Marlowe was responsible for a lot of the blank verse in Shakespeare. You're saying he was the master of blank verse. If you needed blank verse, he was the guy you called in to do a writing job. Mm -hmm. And these were working writers, working playwrights, working actors. Um, so they were always, you know, playing with their material. And heck, a lot of the actors were probably illiterate. They had to learn their material by rote, just hearing it recited. Someone, again, reading aloud to them, which was how most people absorb stuff. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, he, he was the blank verse master. And you can see the style in some of the Shakespeare plays. It really looks like Marlowe wrote that. So that, that's an indicator that, you know, if you, if you admit that far, maybe you can admit that Marlowe wrote more than just that. Yeah. And, you know, um, let me also point out, too, I, I said it in the last episode, but I'll say it again. You know, I I understand that Marlowe did die early, okay? But I'm not saying that Marlowe was the only person that wrote Shakespeare. You know what I mean? Right. Right. <laughs> like, there, <clears throat> there was a whole, in my, my take of it, there was a whole group of men, maybe even women, I don't know, but they, <clears throat> who wrote these, these stories, you know, and, uh, and he was one of them. Just because he died doesn't mean that they just, you know, close up shop and it's well, done. I, you know? that, that, that's all I was getting at, you know. That's actually, that makes a lot of sense. Because it does, you know, seem like a, you'd need a whole committee of writers to cover all the different aspects of the plays. Because you've got like this incredible blank verse in places, and you've got people that have knowledge of the law and of seamanship and of soldiering. And some of the plays that set like in Italy show knowledge of like the geography and of the politics there. So, you know, it would be tough for one person to be a sailor and a lawyer but what you're talking about that would work because you you got a group that you can you can tap their skills mm -hmm. and like you're saying just because one member dies you don't set, shut up shop you know you keep soldiering on yep. mm -hmm. but uh yeah and the, yeah there definitely was a philip or a philip <laughs> philip marlowe no right there definitely was a christopher <laughs> marlowe and uh you know who we have records of his birth and his death and um you do have some issues with his his attribution as the author of even his own plays though one interesting thing and I was reading this article by a guy named Mather Walker and uh, he talks about the fact that uh, in his lifetime none of Marlowe's plays were published under his name they were all published anonymously it was only after he died that the plays came out with his name on them. Now that that is explainable. Not you know a lot of plays were simply pirated. Mm -hmm. You know they they would just uh, because people wanted to read the plays or stage them themselves. And you know people people were more interested in getting that signed check. They didn't care so much about authorship credit necessarily. Um, you know and and also the plays were a bit politically inflammatory sometimes. So you might want to distance yourself from them. Oh, I didn't write that. My name's not on it. You know. Um, mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's kind of suggestive, just kind of suggestive, because uh, that's another aspect of the theory. Maybe Marlowe didn't write Shakespeare. Maybe Shakespeare wrote Marlowe. And, oh, wow. Um, that, that's, you know, you can look at it that way, too. Although, again, yeah, it's, it's just suggestive, because I, I, you know, Marlowe was referred to by other writers as another writer. But I don't think we have any direct letters or anything linking him specifically to specific plays that he wrote. I need to dig into that a little more myself to tell you mm -hmm. the truth, because I, I was reading this today. I, I really should. Um, I wish I'd found this. I'd read this article like years ago, and I just remembered it today. And I wish I'd thought of it earlier, because I would have posted it for you guys to take a look at. And I'll, I'll share the link. But. Um, yeah, that I think that's kind of suggestive. Just that there, there's no no name on the plays as long as he was alive. But after he died, they started putting his name on some of these. So, awesome. well, if you share that link with us, I'll pop it down in the description after the show, so okay. anybody who's interested can go the, and. I'll put it on the chat here. Okay, cool. Yeah, and, cool. You know, the thing <clears throat> too about Marlowe is like, like with these discussions. Uh, the reason why I got so excited about this episode was because of Marlowe. You know what I mean? Marlowe is like the bread and butter of this whole story. 
you know shakespeare <clears throat> this 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 uh this theory right here which it's not a conspiracy everybody likes to call it that but it's not all right <laughs> this is actually right uh, this is actually a theory and it's a valid one because there's actual evidence backing up these people's claims you know but the the the, mm -hmm. the whole thing about this with with marlo what makes him the bread and butter of all of it is the fact that his story is insane i mean just completely insane it just keeps getting deeper and deeper and deeper and the farther you dig into christopher marlo's life the crazier it gets yeah amazing okay so i'm going to ask you now roger to start us off at his school oh. he went he went to we, let's dig let's start digging at his school because weird stuff happened at his school okay was it king's cross was it uh he was 14 and when and when he was a pupil at king's uh school at K uh, Canterbury mm -hmm. on a scholar on a scholarship and two years later a student at Corpus Christi College in Cambridge um, mm -hmm. he studied through a scholarship uh, with expectations that he would become an angelica angelic an angelican clergyman which by the way I don't agree with that there is no way Christopher Marlowe wanted to be an Anglican clergyman. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. um, Which is fascinating. So why he was there at all is weird. But then when he came to get his degree, he had to get special permission. What was that about, Otto? Well, again, we're going by like the records we have. And um, apparently, according to the records, um, Marlowe simply was skipping class a lot. Sometimes he'd be gone the whole term. And uh, mm -hmm. it was getting near time when they would traditionally be giving him his master's degree. They'd be examining him. And uh, at that time, they didn't actually have written examinations. You <clears throat> basically hung out with a couple of uh, professors, had a glass of sherry or whatever. And after a discussion, they would decide whether you showed sufficient, you know, knowledge of your subject. Plus, it was expected they would know how much work you'd done over the year. They knew their pupils, so mm -hmm. it was getting time for him to get his master's, and they're like, well, he's never around. All he does is eat. Um, should we <laughs> even give him a master's? We'll think, you know, we, we want to give him this. So the um, government sent a special letter Um signed by uh, some, you know, some very powerful uh, people, including um, people involved with the intelligence services, shall we say. And they even mentioned specifically that the queen herself uh, did not like the, the idea of um, his degree being withheld because he had been in good service for the government. He basically, been, it's generally interpreted that he was working as a spy um, for the British government and uh, probably involved in the entrapment of overseas Catholics and um, so basically the Privy Council instructed uh, them to give, give Marlowe his degree. Um, so this, this was seen as a direct reward, one of his rewards for his work um, as an undercover agent. Here's a master's degree. Fascinating. So from the Privy Council. Yeah, let me see if I get the exact, um, I tried to have some see try to have some uh, reference material right here um, while you're looking uh, at our part, so I'm going to just ask Roger Roger didn't you yeah, mention please. didn't you mention something about one of Queen Elizabeth's nieces or something yeah um, being on now what was that story we, we we can discuss that but that 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 comes right after what he's doing right now i mean this this is 
um, the privy counselor council is is really important okay because like um, there's a guy that's involved in that and with uh, the niece of uh, Mary Bloody Mary uh, uh, what, what was her mm -hmm. name uh, Queen of Scots yeah old Mary yeah. yeah okay and uh sir francis uh wassingham was in charge of the privy counselor council okay and um he's the one who was uh the one who uh was uh giving the the message to um cambridge to allow Marlo to graduate and whenever he did that uh, he uh, had a letter that commended uh, Marlo for his faithful uh, dealing and good service to the Queen and uh, mm -hmm. that that was what uh, ended up getting him his degree and graduating um, mm -hmm. The nature of uh, his services, though it wasn't uh, specified by the by the council, um, mm -hmm. but its letter to Cambridge authorities uh, was documented in their minutes. They don't have record of what the letter that was sent to them, but they do have it in the minutes for the for the uh, privy c council. Right. No. Right. The focus that I wanted to mention, though, was Sir Francis Walsingham. Okay. Now, he was he was the big guy. He was the one that was sending these spies out to do their uh, their their secret, you know, secret service stuff. You know, mm -hmm. top secret stuff. So, um, whenever it comes to Marlowe there's been allegations that says that he was uh, Mary of Scott's uh, niece's tutor, okay? But at the same time, they also have records showing that he was in jail. Now, wow. I, this, if this was uh, secret service work that he's doing, <clears throat> They would have stuff like that in place, you know what I mean, for a cover, so that it would give an excuse for why he wasn't where he was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's something you also have to thank, you know, espionage. And yeah. The whole... Espionage and jail and... So did you find that reference there, Otto? I did. <clears throat> this is a quote from the Mather article, so it's, you know some of his interpretation he goes as far back as june of well here he's uh, da, 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 da. we now know that uh, some of the irregularities about marlowe's career resulted because he was a spy working for the elizabethan secret service as far back as june of 1587 the privy council sent a sharply worded letter to the authorities of cambridge university where marlowe was enrolled regarding a student named christopher morley without doubt our man marley uh, Morley, who was due to receive his MA degree the following month, was being, quote, defamed, unquote, by certain people who sought to block his candidature. The council said, among other things, in the reprimand that, quote, he had done Her Majesty good service and deserved to be rewarded for his faithful dealing. Uh, then they even resorted to name dropping, saying, quote, it was not Her Majesty's pleasure that anyone employed as he had been in matters touching the benefit of his country should be defamed by those that are ignorant in the affairs he went about. Now, of course, this doesn't prove that he was a spy, and as Roger points out, they never actually specified what it was he was doing. However, when the Privy Council itself is is writing a letter like this, they, they were extremely powerful. Um, they they wielded awesome power. And, uh, you know, aside, aside from the Queen herself, um, the Privy Council, they, they had a lot of clout, so for them to actually intervene like this, it'd be like, I don't know, it'd be like the National Security Agency or something writing a letter, hey, <laughs> you know, or, or the Cabinet. Um, so it, it's very suggestive. It's very suggestive. Mm -hmm. 
and we knew he, we do know he was hanging out with people that were also involved in, in espionage. And of course, you wouldn't write about that or talk about it too much. Although you never know what might pop up later. They're always finding new documents. We can always mm -hmm. hope something more specific will come up. But I, I do agree it is kind of an assumption because the, the, the Privy Council notes don't say anything about specific uh, espionage work. Mm -hmm. Okay, so another interesting thing that comes up with this Privy Council involvement and the spying and the niece and the looking overseas for Catholics and all this stuff is that just around about this time the Privy Council was beheading a whole lot of people, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, it was one of the things they could do. And uh, <clears throat> they had been uh, beheading uh, people um, just in the previous months to uh, uh, Marlowe's death um, for religious irregularities. Uh, they felt very, very threatened by the, you know, the, the England itself was now a Protestant country, but their Protestantism was not really all that Protestant, at least from the point of view of people that were uh, even further along um, in their attempts to reform, reform the Catholic religion. So, um, you know, you had like Puritans and people that wanted much, much simpler forms of organization for the church. One of, one of the objections to the Roman Catholic Church was the immense amount of wealth that was concentrated in the hands of the Pope. Well, uh, there were people arguing that the immense amounts of wealth concentrated in the hands of the Archbishop of Canterbury was just as bad, if not worse. So, um, and of course, this was seen as a direct threat to the state. And uh, of course, the archbishop being himself, the, the guy that prosecuted a lot of these people, he had a particular axe to grind, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, any kind of religious religion and politics were basically the same thing at the time. And uh, I mean, the, the Pope had been like basically putting contracts out on uh, Elizabeth um, for years. Their, their, their stated goal was to remove her from the throne and place Mary, Queen of Scots, on the throne as the only legitimate Catholic Stuart ruler. Um, that was one of the reasons why bringing James down from Scotland was seen as a great way of healing a lot of the religious tensions, because you got to remember, too, from Elizabeth's point of view, half her subjects were probably recusant Catholics. That is to say, Catholics who were forced into Anglican form but who still stayed faithful to the Catholic religion. They even had a form that they could sign with their priest uh, before they were forcibly converted, saying, you know, I'm, not, I'm, I'm only being forced to convert. And the priest said, it's okay. You can still be a Catholic and you have to pretend. Um, so they were, they were the, the recusants. So at least half, if not more, of Elizabeth's subjects had religious um, reservations about her legitimacy. Um, so James would remove that sort of thing so mm -hmm. but in the meantime uh the elizabethan government felt it was very vulnerable to any sort of religious irregularity that could weaken it in the face of, of the catholic attacks and a lot of the times they i think they would probably blame a lot of this this unrest on jesuit agents mm -hmm. there was also an uh, interesting thing that's when priests stopped shaving the tops of their heads you know like friar tuck the tonsure that was a very strict old Catholic priest for the longest time, but it was the wars in religion. Um, when they would try to send Jesuit missionaries into these countries that had converted to Protestantism, and all they do is they catch somebody with their head shaved and they just burn them. So the <laughs> priests were allowed to stop shaving their heads, and they, they never took it up again, which is weird. But oh, I don't know why I thought of that. <laughs> That's very interesting. It's full of intrigue because the more you talk about it, the more this aspect of religion seems to be hugely prominent because Roger you said that uh, Marlowe was possibly being used as a spy yeah. with Queen Mary well Mary Queen of Scots niece now if they were the Catholics and Elizabeth were the Anglicans then and, and Marlowe was in a school to be an Anglican priest does seem as this this is all religious wars doesn't it yeah and uh with uh that too on uh there there's also uh speculations from two people uh once park hannon and charles nickel and they speculated um that marlo was a, sp a government spy okay and uh 
they also go further <clears throat> and they say that in 1857 when the Privy Council ordered the University of Cambridge to award Marlowe his degree um, it denied rumors that he intended to go to the English Catholic College in Rhymes saying instead that he had been engaged in unspecified affairs on matters touching the benefit of his country you know but they say that he was actually going to go to the English Catholic College in Rhymes instead of being angelic uh, uh, thing, you know. And mm -hmm. if if he was a spy, then that would be his way in. You know what I mean? He he would go in. He'd get an education with the Catholic Church. He would end up going and becoming a tutor like they're talking about and tutoring somebody close to Queen Mary of Scots. That's yes. the way I see it. I mean... How extraordinary. So another very interesting thing that comes up, I mean, I, I know that the, we, we haven't even touched on his writing with all these intrigues happening around him, but a very interesting thing about his death comes up where they say that they suggest that he was murdered because he was having a gay affair with somebody that's a really strange thing now to bring into the middle of all this religious intrigue that that's is there one, evidence that's Sorry? one reason why i said that um like there, if you really check it out, and I, I don't like getting caught up in a lot of the new age stuff that's coming out when it comes to this, but like with this situation, it, it is a possibility, you know. There, there is a lot of uh, underground movements taking place during that time period which concerned atheism, it concerned homosexuality. Um, and like I said, you know, people who were nobles wouldn't be caught at the place, you know what I mean? That was the place where the nobles didn't go, because to them, that's where the reprobates went. So, in order for them to go to the place, they had to sneak in there and make it to where nobody knew that they were there, you know, so... You had a lot of things going on during that time period that... Yeah, it could. There could have been homosexuality going on too. I mean, there, there, there's a good chance, you know, that that that, that is valid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it might have been a factor, certainly. But um, you know, we have to keep in mind as well that that was also something that you would throw at an enemy. Yeah. You know, while he's gay, or they, you know, whatever. And mm -hmm. um, interesting. At the same time, you did have public men, Sir Francis Bacon, for example, uh, Anthony Bacon, and others who were publicly called, you know, from the pulpits, uh, you know, declared to be homosexuals, and um, nothing much ever, had, of course, as to point out, you know, they're very wealthy, powerful, they don't really have anything much to fear from that. Something like that probably wouldn't be all that act in and of itself, but it would be one of the things that were heaped upon him, you know, one, one of the things that... Um, they found digging through the archives are these accusations that um, he was an atheist and in fact had, had composed an atheist sermon or an atheist book um, because he was a divinity student and um, as a divinity student he read the Bible with a very critical eye and said you know well you know the kind of guy that says well maybe the ravens weren't feeding Elijah maybe Elijah was feeding the ravens <laughs> you know he had some <laughs> Yeah. You know, just, just looking, you know, saying, wait, wait, we can explain these miracles and, and stuff like that. Um, and, you know, it's interesting getting, kind of getting back, um, circling back, if you'll pardon the expression, to um, talking about uh, Marlowe possibly going going overseas to the, the uh, Catholics and going to the, the Catholic University there. Um, it wasn't necessarily uncommon for someone who was being trained in the Anglican Church to be reading all of these church fathers and decide, hey, wait a minute, I, I think Catholicism is, is the real deal. So, you know, some of them did go and do that. And uh, actually, to this day, if you're an Anglican priest, 
because they like getting priests and mm -hmm. you decide to switch over to the church of rome you get to they make you a full roman priest priest of the roman rite and if you're married you get to keep your wife so there are actually married roman catholic priests not very many but any, any anglican priest that wants to be a married roman catholic priest can do that which That's is another interesting thought. wow and, so when they say atheist they might not have meant a non-believer they might have meant that he believed the doctrine of the other side possibly it, it, you know it, it was again a very much a political kind of a judgment and to them atheism was denying the gospel and denying the teachings of the church and uh, of course that included the teaching that the queen ruled by divine right um, as uh, Farrar points out in his article on the subject um, atheist, atheism meant that oaths meant nothing in court mm -hmm. and that there was no reason to engage in religious wars why should we go and invade a Catholic country just because they're Catholic wait a minute if, if that's you know that's all nonsense I don't think it would preclude him having other spiritual or even other religious beliefs I think at that but at that time um, atheism was seen as just disbelief in the Christian faith and since all other faiths were false false anyway obviously you believe in no God since there was only one God to believe in but he seemed to be very much a, a materialist um, from what we know of him um, I, I don't think that he was like a secret uh, Muslim as they called it back then or um, a devil worshiper or anything wacky like that I think he, he just kind of at, at a time when religion was, um, in Protestantism especially, pushes the authority of the scriptures, as opposed to the, the traditional Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church as well, um, they, they, they lean more heavily on tradition, later interpretations and metaphorical ideas, whereas the Protestantism was really pushing hard, just read the scriptures, that'll, that'll give you all the answers. And he read them with a hypercritical eye, a very intelligent eye, and started seeing all these holes. Because, of course, it's, it's an mm -hmm. immensely complex book written by many, many different people, many of them with very different and subtle uh, ideas about divinity, then edited, variously edited, then translated a couple of three times. And, um, yeah, he found a lot of the holes you could drive a bus through. Mm -hmm. And these aren't a problem to a person that approaches it from a religious standpoint or a spiritual standpoint, but he wasn't doing it that way. So for him to attack the scriptures like that, meant to attack the whole edifice of, of religion, he had no nothing else to fall back on spiritually. And so he just became what we would call, I think, a materialist, an Epicurean, a believer in the atomic theory, as they had it back then, atomism. So. Gosh. What a fascinating man he yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, that's true or not, but that's just my, my guess anyway. Yeah. yeah. Roger, well, what did you say about him being involved in counterfeiting? Um, well, yeah, and uh, this kind of goes with something that I, I did want to uh, bring. Hold up, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll let that squeaky door pass before I say it, but... <laughs> but, um... The counterfeiting kind of fits into what we were talking about with uh, the the excessive eating in college. Okay, now Marlo, when uh, Otto was talking about him eating, doing nothing but sitting around eat, eating a lot, you know, the thing about it is, is with uh, Marlo. When he was in college, he was eating excessively. Um, they do have records of when he was in college and his expenses and what he bought from the cafeterias and stuff like that. And they say for how much money he should have been getting, okay, with his scholarship income, um, he, he was way... Uh, he he was living way above his means you know what i mean mm -hmm. so um he was going to college and while he was in college he wasn't attending class like he was supposed to and when he was there he was living lavishly and spending money that he shouldn't have had so that that was one thing that really connects him to it and uh Another thing with the spy ring and everything, uh, they they do believe that he was involved with being a counterfeit 
they also believed that he was uh, also the guy called Morley, who was the tutor of uh, Arbella Stewart. And that was in, in 1589. Um, now, this all goes back to Francis Bacon. Now, Francis Bacon's uncle, his name was William Cecil, okay? Um, and William Cecil was also involved with the, um, what is it, the Privy Council? Yeah, yeah. He and his son Robert, yeah. And uh, I, from what I've found out during the time that Marlowe was over in Europe and the counterfeiting thing happened, uh, mm -hmm. Cecil was also there, and so was uh, Francis Will Willshire or whatever his name was. I just said it a little while ago, but they, right. they, they were all in the same. Uh, basic area at the same time during that time period so mm -hmm. for me I, I could see the counterfeiting taking place and him being actually involved in counterfeiting and getting busted and all that good stuff so mm -hmm. I, I, I don't have the story on how all that went down straight 100% but maybe Otto could fill in the blanks there uh, I don't I'm not I don't really have much more on it as far as the counterfeiting. I do know that um, at the time, counterfeiting was a very serious crime, and the Elizabethan um, police state, you know, Secret Service would usually do what we would call massive entrapment. So, and there, there was one of the accusations leveled against um, Marlowe was that he was a coiner. I think that was in the... Um, or something called the Bainbridge Note, and there were accusations that William Kidd made about him under torture. Uh, a lot mm -hmm. of that had to do with his atheism, but um, one of the things was that, that he had said that he had as much right to coin um, as anybody else, as, as, as the Queen of England. You know, why, why should the Treasury be the only one allowed to make coins? And uh, which was actually a very anarchistic, for the time, kind of a statement. But the thing is, if, if he was in, working to entrap coiners, and what they would generally do is kind of like what they, they do to this day. They, they basically suggest to someone the crime, provide a lot of the tools of the crime, get the person to engage in the crime with them, and then arrest them. You know, after they brought in the metals and the smelting and showed them how to do it and then got them to help them. And then so, um, yeah, it was like extreme entrapment, extreme entrapment. And of course, when you entrap someone like that, you could either just, you know, have them, you know, tried and executed, or you could use them as further aids held by blackmail because the punishment for coining, you see, the coin had a picture of the queen on it. So counterfeiting a coin was considered a form of treason, petty treason, but treason all the same. And so the punishment was the full drawing and quartering, which we won't describe in detail here, mm -hmm. but basically it was pretty gruesome. And yes, they mm -hmm. still did it quite publicly in Elizabethan times. Uh, right down to the point of after they finished quartering, you send the quarters to like four different places to hang up somewhere to remind people not to counterfeit coins. So it was, a, it was a very effective crime to entrap someone with because hmm. you could hold over that death over them. And that's also a way that intelligent agents get recruits sometimes. It's always like by bribery. Sometimes it's blackmail. He hung out with a lot of very insalubrious people. I think that yeah. it's very interesting, uh, his his death, the, in the coroner's report, I don't know, there's uh, controversy over which coroner's report is real, but apparently there was witnesses at his uh, hearing, <laughs> the one fellow, Robert Poley, is on record right. as saying, I will swear and forswear myself rather than I will accuse myself to do me any harm. Another mm -hmm. fellow, Nicholas Kerris, had for many years acted as a con man, drawing mm -hmm. young men into the clutches of people in the, men in the money lending racket, including Marlowe's apparent killer, Ingram Freiser. So mm. they didn't, they didn't, they weren't 
they weren't of noble behavior were they mm -hmm. even though they might have been of noble birth i uh, they, crook is no, a crook, they, man. They did. <laughs> sorry what was that roger <laughs> crook is a crook i mean <laughs> <laughs> You can paint it any color you want, but a crook is a crook, man. <laughs> I, I get a kick out of that. Every time I read that, I'm like, seriously? And people try to make these guys out to be like they were noble and honorable and stuff. I'm like, are you serious? They're con men. They were liars, thieves. One of them, didn't one of them even say that they, they, they had no problem with lying in court? Yes, Robert Coley. Had no, no. no. no, no they, 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 Yeah, these, these these were guys who were, and uh, Archie Barnack used to call your lower socioeconomic class. These are the people that live on the edges of society, and those were the people that then, as now, were often recruited uh, to do, uh, you know, sort of dirty work that uh, somebody higher up on the social latter wouldn't want to do you, you can almost make an argument there was something similar in the united states in the 19th century where all of the uh unruly italian immigrants were seen as a problem causing crime and disturbance so they would take the irish immigrants who were seen as rough and tough but at least you know intelligent enough to take orders from an englishman and they would make them the police that's why i have a tradition here in the u.s at least in the east northeastern u.s of, of irish policemen who were basically seen as a as a gang, uh, almost human, but certainly better than those Italians. And he would often <laughs> uh, just the same idea. You would always go to these people that were considered to be um, a little shady. And these guys were definitely shady types. These were definitely mm -hmm. shady types. Yeah, and they they all had um, the relationships with um, you know people higher up in the social ladder, and. Uh, you know, and so they are actually just the, the perfect, um, perfect profile for people that would be involved. I think in like espionage work. Amazing, but that's not all. There's also a suggestion that he wasn't gay at all, but he was having an affair with somebody else's wife. What was that what? about, Roger? Um. um now I believe the one part that I I heard I I don't know if this is the same one but it was Walsingham um now Walsingham from I'm, the Privy Council Yeah but there's uh two stories I think that goes to that one was that uh his wife was jealous of him for um having romantic affairs with her husband yeah, because he was supposed to be gay. Oh, I, guess. I see. With the husband. I thought it was with the wife. And uh, um, she was supposed to have done a hit on him because she, she was upset about it. And uh, I don't know for sure but I think I have heard where it was the other way around too, where Walsingham wanted to get rid of uh, of um, <laughs> Marlowe because Marlowe knew too much and s stuff like that. Um, I also <clears throat> found in my notes too that um, he was uh, arrested for uh, counterfeiting. Um, Mm. Um, and uh, it, it was in nineteen or 1592 he was arrested in the English garrison town of Flushing which is Flessing, Flessingen in the Netherlands mm -hmm. for, alleged, right. for alleged involvement in counterfeiting of coins presumably related to the activities of seditious Catholics he was sent to the Lord's treasurer burglary or burglary but no charges or imprisonment resulted the arrest may have disrupted another of Marlowe's spying missions perhaps by giving the resulting coinage to the Catholic cause 
He was to infiltrate the followers of the active ca Catholic plotters, uh, plotter William Stanley, and report back to Burgley. Now, uh, St St Stanley was the guy that uh, he there, there was a plot that he was doing against uh, the Queen where he wanted the Queen off the throne and uh, Mary mm -hmm. in, in place and th they were um, working on getting that done at the time and uh, Cecil as a, uh, along with Sir Francis Walsingham were uh, working together through the Privy Council to um, to deter that from happening and the, he was their enemy and it's speculated that Marlowe was supposed to infiltrate his organization with these uh, coins and these forged coins but he was arrested in the process of doing it good heavens it took me a little while to figure it out, but in the meantime, I completely forgot the name of the plot that was supposed to be taking place. And I had it even in in my head, and I forgot what it was <laughs> from all this reading. <laughs> <clears throat> it's like, like I said, this stuff is amazing. It just it's completely amazing. It is. Yeah. But that's not the only theory, is it? What were you telling me, uh, Otto, about it being related to Sir Walter Raleigh? Well, that was one was idea. Raleigh at that time was um, banished from court, I believe. Although he was still a member of Parliament, he went in and out of favor over the years. He was a troublemaker. Um, def Raleigh definitely was, I, I mean, he we know that Marlowe spent time in the Raleigh Circle, a lot of it's supposition but it, it was known that Marlowe was friendly to the people around Raleigh and harming Marlowe was a way of harming Sir Walter Raleigh but um, at that time Raleigh had very little influence so because at the time Mar Marlowe was killed he was under arrest uh, technically he had, you know, he had bail so called parole, he had to report to the Brewery Council on a daily basis until they got around um, to um, dealing with him, but uh, in the meantime, he was he was staying with um, with uh, Walsingham, and uh, I just was uh, looking at some information here about the men who were present when when Marlow died, and it's interesting mm -hmm. to see who these these low lifes were uh, affiliated with. Now, um, Ingram, you know, just I'm going to read verbatim from this article. Ingram Fraser was in the service of Thomas Walsingham of Chislehurst, a cousin of the late great spy master Sir Francis Walsingham. So there's mm -hmm. intelligence work right there. The same Thomas Walsingham was Mar Marlowe's master or patron. At this time, Marlowe was living with him at Scadbury. That's who he was staying with. Um, Fryser had a somewhat shady background. He was later involved in uh, the loan sharking that Roger was talking about. Um, and that there is evidence that he was a spy in the service of Thomas Walsingham for a considerable period and Thomas worked, uh, you know, as a controller of a number of spies employed by Francis Walsingham. Now, Nicholas Skears was an accomplice to Fraser in that blackmailing episode. Um, in, in fact, he was a very shady guy. His name shows up on a list compiled in 1585 of a number of masterless men in cut purses whose practice is to rob gentlemen's chambers and artificers' shops in and about London. But then he, uh, the same Skiers shows up as a government plant in the Babington plot. And by 1589, <laughs> he was working in the Essex uh, spy service, doing work for which he received official payment under a warrant signed by Sir Francis Walsingham. In the course of the evidence he gave concerning his dealing with Wolfel the Skinner, he describes the Earl of Essex as, quote, his lord and master. So, mm. um, and he goes on to say, of the three men present at the stabbing of Marlowe, Poli is the most complex and the most sinister. His career as a spy went well back over two decades, taken to many countries as well as into the Tower and the Marshal Sea. Notorious among Catholics as a double dealer, informer, agent provocateur, and poisoner. He's been called the very genius of the Elizabethan underworld. Wow. And, uh, mm -hmm. and this was one of the points, and I was talking about this before, on the day of Marlowe's death, 
Poli had returned from one of his confidential missions to the Netherlands. Two weeks later, he received payment of 30 pounds for this work on a warrant signed by Sir Thomas Hennage. Poli was Robert Cecil's man, but mm -hmm. Poli um, was supposed to be traveling on post in haste, to apparently delivering messages back and forth. But he spent a week after, and, and, you know, after returning to England, including the time uh, that included Marlowe's death, before reporting back. So technically, when Marlowe was killed, this guy was officially on the clock for the crown. Ooh. And, yeah, and they made no thing about when they, when, uh, they said um, two weeks later he received his payment. Uh, they didn't make any, there was apparently no static about the fact that he took that long, even though he was supposedly on post, you know, in haste. So, mm -hmm. um, so that also is suggestive that he was still doing government work at that time. So all yes. these guys were not just like really kind of low life underworld figures, but they were underworld figures with connections to the, the uh, two competing intelligence agencies, mm -hmm. um, Essex and the, and, uh, and uh, Berkeley, the Cecils there. Right. And see, so, with, uh, William Cecil, okay, with uh, Francis Bacon, at the same time that all this was going on, you got to remember, Francis Bacon was also in Europe at the time, not in England. He was an ambassador for the Queen overseas. I believe it was in Paris. He was in France. Yeah, yeah. And uh, his, he and his brother both were, were closely associated with intelligence work as well. Mm -hmm. um, Anthony Bacon in particular. Um, so yeah, there are a lot of weird interconnecting intelligence agency tentacles here. Yeah. So Bacon did know, it, you know, he was moving in circles that would have known of Marlowe. And uh, so that they were in contact is not unlikely. Fascinating. You suggest, Otto, it seems from what you just read, that there could be a suggestion there that the Queen ordered his assassination. That could be, although I always tend to think, I like to use Occam's razor, I mean, if, if someone like the Queen or even just a, a, a powerful nobleman really just wanted him dead, a very easy thing to arrange. I mean, this guy lived on the edge with underworld figures, a knife in an alley somewhere, and, and dumped off a bridge or pitched over the side of a boat. Well, next time he was going over to the Netherlands, just send a couple of guys with him. Um, so, if, I think if she just wanted him dead, she'd just order him dead. I think it might be more that people that killed him, and this is assuming he was killed, you know, we're leaving out the idea that they might have faked his death. Um, <laughs> might have not wanted certain information to come up because the Privy Council did have competing factions on it and that's an old tried and true thing they teach you at King's School is uh, you know you have competing agencies and they had competing intelligence agencies and you know you, you, you keep it keeps them honest that way and they, they if they're, they're fighting each other they don't have time to try to pull you down mm -hmm. so there might have been a group on the Privy Council that were afraid that Marlowe would reveal things that would uh, be inconvenient for them and I just get the feeling that when he died, there there were these three guys present, all of whom had more or less obvious connections to the same intelligence community that Marlowe was mm -hmm. in. Marlowe was scheduled to be questioned under torture, and who knows what he might have been threatening to say if they didn't get him out of this, or was going to say, or what they were afraid he would say. So it could have been higher-ups just didn't want whatever he was going to say to get out. And he was already under the supervision of the Privy Council because there were some people that did want that stuff to get out. So they, they didn't really have a chance to, to kill him too easily. Um, but this would have been a way to do it. And I mean, the whole thing, you know, oh, there's three of us. There's this guy lying down on a bed. He started attacking us, so we stabbed him in the eye. We couldn't do anything else. <laughs> there were only three <laughs> of us. We were all of us, you know. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it just seems a little, you know, yeah. suspicious. Yeah. Very, very strange. And you, you got to realize there's at least three or four times that this man had been arrested <clears throat> and he had gotten off scot free. And not only did he get off yeah. scot free, but like within days after being arrested, he was released. Released. Yeah. You know, I mean, it <laughs> there were higher powers enough for him. 
Yeah. So he was involved with these guys, but it's dangerous to get involved with those guys too sometimes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, too and much. Or... He was 26 when he was killed. Mm-hmm. Is that right? He was a very young man, yeah. That's something I was talking about the other day, that the youth of all these people, the energy they had. You know, when mm-hmm. you're going to college at 13, 14, 15, and you're starting your career in the world at like 19, 20, 21, and uh, of course, back then you were very often dead before you were forty. You know, I think the average life expectancy was something like in the late thirties. Some people mm-hmm. did live to have, you know, have a ripe old age, but it was very, very, very easy to die back then. Um, I forget who it was. I think it might have been Pepys, but somebody like was getting a splinter out of their finger or something, or a little worm or something was in their finger. They they pricked it out with a pin, and they were dead a week later from like blood poisoning and sepsis. You know, just a little cut. We don't think anything of it. We just put a little peroxide on it or methylate. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, death always walked very close to them all. So they, they started their life young. And, man, when you're that young, just the intensity of the things you do, some of them mm-hmm. wacky and insane, like, uh, you know, brawling in the streets of London and writing amazing plays. <laughs> well, it's, <clears throat> it's just like in those... Uh, those talking notes that I've mentioned in there, there's part in there about Marlowe's plays, you know, and how everybody tries to make him out to be like he was a hum- humanist and, uh, you know, uh, he had re- realistic emotions and all that stuff. But if you read what he's saying, I mean, he, he, he was an anti-intellectual, you know what I mean? Um, he had, a lot of his writings involved violence, cruelty, and bloodshed, you know. It, I mean where they come up with that yeah. I don't understand that about him being like a, a humanist and all that stuff he in his writings he was very brutal I mean for that time and age yeah he really was yeah yeah well they always try to project these things you know he, he's great therefore he has to be what we think a great person should be but no he was a he was writing some stuff that, um, you know, if he was around today, he'd be making movies. Yeah. And he'd be making movies like Die Hard, you know, yeah. action, adventure, mm-hmm. things blowing up, you know, people fighting each other, the conflict, you know, he, he loved that kind of thing. And um, yeah, that I think that a lot of his, and, and even like, you know, Faust, which is, um, you know, has less action, but it's, there's a great deal of intellectual struggle there. You know, Faust wrestling with himself, even. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, and and um, there's there's all times in there when he he's trying to turn away from this course that's l- taking him literally to hell, <laughs> and he just every time he just fails. It's, but the struggle is there, and you do get a lot of apparently. Mm-hmm. I um, I've read accounts of when they did Faust the, the play, uh, they did use a lot of special effects that the audience loved. I'm sure they used firecrackers, which were very new at the time, sparklers. And lots of like smoking right. sulfur for special yes. effects. People in devil costumes supposedly scared the yes. heck out of a kid. <laughs> you know, this is the most fascinating conversation. We haven't even started getting into his his work or how it corresponds to Shakespeare or Bacon or any of the other guys that were there at the time. And we haven't even mentioned that this gruesome death of his happened before a lot of the Shakespeare play- plays were published. But the saddest thing of all is that we've come to the end of our time today. And so I need to wrap this up. Thank you guys so much for listening. It is so great that we've had you with us and that you've stuck with us through this really fascinating discussion I'm not sure if we're going to be back next week but we will be back and so if you have any questions if you would like us to investigate anything please drop them there in the comments you you know we will do our best to look at your ideas and your uh, perspectives and your take on it and um, so yeah go ahead questions and comments really welcome And finally, it comes to thanking you, Otto and Roger, for your insight into this and for your time. It's a fascinating conversation, and I really hope we can do it again soon. 
No problem. Thanks for Thanks having me. Much. So no, it's a lot of fun. We're going to have to do another show on this topic, though. We have a lot further to go, so I think this might turn into a multi-part show if Roger's up for it. Oh, yeah. I, I, I love it. And like I said, I'm really thankful that you actually come in and want to have a conversation with me, Otto, because you can't find too many people that even want to have a conversation about this. So I'm, I'm really You're right. Thankful. Yeah, yeah. I'm really glad. No, I'm, I'm glad. I'm gl yeah, I'm glad you want to talk about it, too. Like you say, it's very hard to find people that are talk on this topic. So we're having a, a lot of fun with this. We should keep going with this for a while. I agree. Absolutely. Ah, uh, yay. Okay, so we will very likely be net back next week. So, guys, look out for the link, and we will see you again next time. Until then, goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Bobbing Along with Bob Dub. If you enjoy content like this, be sure to like, share, and subscribe. Or better yet, come and join us on Minds.com slash Bob Dub. If you're not already a member on Minds, get a free account on this open source social media platform. We look forward to seeing you next week for another episode of Bobbing Along with Bob. And if you can't wait a week, you can find older shows here on this channel. Goodbye, everyone. Bobbing, bob, bob, bobbing, bobbing along, bobbing along, bob, bob, bobbing, bob, bob, bobbing, bobbing along, bobbing along.